All right, as always, thank you for hanging out. First in pod, Danny Parkins, Andrew Filipponi, every team, every game, every week. Coming to you after a workmanlike, kind of boring, kind of weird Chiefs-Broncos. Broncos haven't beat the Chiefs since the Alex Smith era. And ho-hum, right? The offense, Mahomes looked sloppy, I thought, for a bit. But overall... You know, survive in advance for the Chiefs. So if you were back in your old spot, drive time in Kansas City on Friday, you'd say Jimmy Valvano survive in advance would be where you'd start the show. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know why though? Because like I don't they, they've earned such benefit of the doubt to me. Is that a cop out? Is that a cop out to just I say? Feel like, hey, like, like, like I feel like you they're want allowed like a, to win these ugly games. Yeah, like I feel like you want like a like a stronger, more declarative thing. Like it was a Thursday game against a division rival with strong wins, and they yeah. covered the spread. You like what you know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna. I I didn't think they looked particularly impressive. But their defense held a team to single digits in the NFL on a short week. I mean, I just, I don't know. I, uh, you know, I, our buddy Nick Wright thinks that they are just practicing things. Tight end <laughs> lateral plays, tush push on special teams. That this is just practice uh, for the Chiefs as they continue to try to figure things out. I, I don't know if it's that deliberate, but... I do think that Andy Reid holds things back for big games. I've seen that before plenty of times. So, yeah, I just – I found I found myself pretty bored watching that game tonight. Well, I, I'm happy you said that because I thought I was going to make some kind of confession here that was going to make me look bad in the eyes of our uh, loyal listeners, and Nick Wright is among them. Uh, I had This was the first Thursday night football game all year where I wasn't from kickoff to final whistle invested watching every second of the game. I was flipping over to the Braves and Phillies game. I was flipping over to the Houston West Virginia football game, which had one of the best finishes of the entire college football season. Uh, Kansas city to me remind everybody had one of these situations and I hate to bring it up, but that's just the best analogy that's in my head right now. When we were in our 20s, there was always a girl you could text or call and she would get back to you. And I just feel like that's how Kansas is like, okay, like we, I don't have to work hard. I don't have to do much. I don't have to try. We'll, we'll, we'll do what it takes to beat the Broncos. We're not going to do, we're not going to, you know, have to pee blood here to win this game. Just whatever. You know, like, the, the the only negative I would say on the air tomorrow, if I were Carrington Harrison doing the Patrick Mahomes show in that afternoon drive show on our affiliate station there is, if Travis Kelsey in that ankle, if he was inactive for this game, uh, the Chiefs win, but it shouldn't be that hard. You know, like when he has more yards than the Broncos in a half of football, if you subtract him out of this game, I think Mahomes still finds a way to beat Sean Payton and Russell Wilson. I do. But they have to, maybe they're experimenting or practicing to Nick's point because they have to find more guys in their offense who can make plays. And Rice does. I like him. Yeah. yeah the the, the uh, one thing that from the broadcast that caught my ear, and this is just like inside media a little bit. But Collinsworth said it wouldn't surprise me if by the end of the year, Rice was the go-to receiver. And they're just getting more comfortable. Herb Street? Herb Street. Herb Street. Excuse me. Yeah, Herb Street. But like you, you've you talked to enough of these broadcasters. You know how it goes. Like They have these production meetings, and often they are parroting the sentiments yeah. of the coaches that they talk to. And so I, I wonder, you know, for fantasy football players, for prop betters, if, you know, I mean, he did not have a big game, but again, it was a weird passing game. Two targets, two catches, 30 yards. Kelsey was dominant. Um, I, I do wonder if if maybe that was something that the, that the Chiefs coaches believe that 
by, you know, money time, Rice is going to be the dude for the Chiefs. Speaking of receivers, did you see what happened with Steve Smith and Jerry Judy before the game? Yes, of course. Steve Smith is one of the coolest football players of our lifetime. He is such a badass. And obviously, if you or I did something like that, we would be suspended or maybe fired. And I don't know what will happen to Steve Smith from a broadcasting standpoint, but like he forgot that he was a broadcaster. Well, what did you th- what 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 did you feel like he did that was objectionable in that Jerry Judy thing? I I didn't I, hear him I, say or do I anything. I personally loved it. I thought it was super entertaining. But to me, that came across like a dude who was like it was personal. Yes, he was challenging him. He was pissed. Good, and, you know, and it just it he was like. Back to the studio. Like he, he that was like legitimate anger. It made for provocative TV. It was the most interesting thing that happened to the Broncos in the entire game. Steve Smith also has the added benefit of being right here. Jerry Judy has underachieved. And Judy backed it up with three catches for 14 yards. Now I stocked the guy on all my fantasy teams like an idiot this year. Uh yeah, like Steve Smith. I saw the guy at the Super Bowl. He's about the he's about the same height as Tom Cruise. He is a small man, and he's an angry man, uh, and that's he why he's a, so he's good. A, he's a tough man. He, you know what I mean. He doesn't. He he will fight anybody. He does not back down. He's a well. That's how a proud. guy that size who was undrafted goes on to be a borderline Hall of Fame player because he's of that awesome. attitude. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it made for tremendous television, and in this case, it was Jerry Judy punching up at an all time great. And it all started because Smith did the did the honorable thing of going up to the guy before the game and said, I've ripped you before, and I just want to know I've respected the way you've played this year. And that jack wagon made it into a whole thing. So Denver got what they deserved. I mean, eight points, embarrassing again. Russell Wilson's 11 touchdowns to two interceptions was the most fraudulent stat line in the entire NFL going into this game. And Sean Payton looks like he got a retirement check from the Broncos and doesn't give a damn. Like he predicted a horrible season. He's now coaching that way. They're doing little dump-offs. He's calling a timeout at the end of the first half, which was completely nonsensical. He gifted the Chiefs points there. Yeah, not looking like a Hall of Fame coach in Denver. Looking like a guy that stole the Walmart money. Let's get to the games. 49ers and Browns. Deshaun Watson has been cleared, but he's unlikely to play. What okay. is going on here? Yes. Yes. Like we did this for the entire summer with the, tr- with the Trey Lance thing. And we would bring up all the time. Why is this not a bigger story? And then eventually it became one. And we felt like we were the Lewis and Clark of that expedition. Like we were the pioneers of that. Why is this not Nick? If you're watching this, why is this not an a one topic on every show right now? I don't care what Chris Broussard says about Baker Mayfield. I want to hear, sorry, Chris. I mm-hmm. want to hear them on. Here's a guy that got $230 million guaranteed. He's been cleared to play. And he's not going to play again. It's going to be P.J. Walker on Sunday. This could have been one of the best games of the entire weekend. But instead, we've got a friggin' AAF quarterback out there, or XFL quarterback, instead of the highest paid quarterback in the entire league, Danny. Well, it's not being framed as entirely cleared. It's been like day-to-day. He was cleared by doctors to play in the game against the Ravens, and he chose not to play. That's been reported. He will be elevated from... Okay, so he just felt like it was the right decision for the team. Stefanski said, PJ's been here now for a month plus, talking about PJ Walker. Listen... I think that it is very strange, and I don't think that they're they're clearly not putting him in on IR. But what is your working theory here? Because he is he is not playing in this game. What is your uh, working let theory? Me just, just for uh, you can't see this, but this just says so. I'm not insane and taking crazy pills. Stefanski clarified that Watson was medically cleared to play against the Ravens in Week Four. Medically cleared. So their doctors looked at him and said, he's good enough to suit up and play in this game, and he didn't. Then they had a bye week, 
And now it's the 49ers, the best team in the NFL. And the guy's like, I'm good. I'm going to take my time. That's unacceptable to me. But again, I don't, but now I, but I see a quote. He's doing everything in his power, working around the clock with rehab. So he's yeah, just, yeah, I think, I think that's just paying it lip service because they're not, they're not trying to create a firestorm by publicly saying their quarterback is being a wimp. So this is very Derrick Rose esque when Derrick Rose came back from the, uh, except that was an ACL and he was out for a much longer period of time. Just like, for our listeners that aren't as familiar with you, who aren't Chicago based, you do have a tendency to tie a lot of things back to Derrick Rose because he's like your favorite athlete after Michael Jordan. So I just want people to be aware of that. That's like, accurate. This is not something that's, whoa, why is Derrick Rose being mentioned? That's kind of odd. No, Danny is a way of like slipping Derrick Rose into conversations where it otherwise doesn't really fit. I think it fits. Uh, the He was medically cleared, but he didn't trust it. And the Bulls said he's cleared. And it became a huge issue because the whole thing was like, well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't you, even if he is cleared, don't say it publicly. Like if he's not comfortable, like let him come back. They're like, at some point he's got to test it. How about a more, how about a more contemporary one in basketball? Zion Williamson last year, same thing. But he's not my favorite player. Fair, but I'm just saying like, this is, this has happened much yes, more recently. Yes. Uh, sport. But this injury, the, the thing that doesn't, this is not that serious of an injury, you know, so it would Watson. not be Watson. That's what I'm saying. Right. But so why your, your theory then is Deshaun Watson got paid. So he's not going to play if he's at anything less than a hundred percent. That's your theory. Okay. Yeah, I think so. What incentive does he have? It's not playing no, for the next contract. Yeah, but but neither is Pat Mahomes or Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert or even though their contract isn't fully guaranteed, it nine figures well in is is Danny, guaranteed. Doesn't he owe it to them to go out and try? And if he g- goes out for a few series or snaps and it just doesn't work, okay, you're out. We're putting PJ Walker in or whatever. I, that's what I think. I mean, I, is is that a is that a ridiculous? No, no, I said I I. I just I have a hard time believing it's because of the contract. That that part just doesn't make any sense to me. And we don't have NFL teams are just they they treat it like it's under you know everything is like a state secret here. We have no idea what's going on. And the Trey Lance thing was performance based. You know, like they that we saw actions. They traded up draft picks, top guy, Mister Irrelevant, and then he never got shot. That was like e- a lot easier to diagnose from afar. I don't know what's wrong with his rotator cuff. Well, that didn't stop people from from talking about Zion Williamson and Derrick Rose and recklessly speculating about their health on television. That's true. No, no I, 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 that that is one hundred percent true. Um, lions and Bucks. Okay, are our go. lions? O U R lions on upset alert? No. Hmm, okay. No. I I'm worried about this one. Okay. I as don't... a new member of the Lions bandwagon, you're gonna have to coach me through this because I am this is not like last week against Carolina where I kicked up my feet and watched them run trick plays to win the game by multiple touchdowns. I don't think that Tampa is going to be able to keep up with the Lions' offense. I Vita Vea is amazing. They've got good linebackers. The Lions have arguably the best offensive line in the NFL. The Lions have a few health issues right now that I don't love, but they're not season enders, so maybe. And Jamison Williams kind of stinks, by the way. Do you think he stinks or it's rust? You forget how to catch a football and get open? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I'm concerned that he might, just might not be good. He had, what, six catches last year? They had had one, I, think he had, I think he had one catch last okay, year. Okay, then it was six targets maybe. Yeah. Six in my head. And then yeah. they had him out there as a special teams gunner. So well, their drafting has definitely been weird because, like, have you seen the thing going around with the Lions fans that they're like, "We can understand our draft 
if Laporta and Branch yeah, were the you first were round saying picks, that after the draft happened. You yeah, and that. and and Campbell and Gibbs were were second rounders. Listen, no, I know we say it early and then people catch up to it. They never uh, give us credit. No, never. We're, we're the little podcast that could. That's what we are. But no, don't you worry, buddy. Lions will hang 27 in Tampa and win that game by 10. That's an easy one. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. Cowboys and Chargers, because it looks like you're trying to find the next one. So I'll just bring it yeah, up. Yeah, I, I need to, you know what? I need to do a better job of saving this thing in a place that's not myself. Buy, do you know. buy Jerry Jones' support of Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott? Yes. Of course I do. Because Jerry Jones, for some weird reason, has insane loyalty to people who are below average at their jobs when it's the most desirable thing in the world in the of football, coaching quarterback of the Cowboys. He, do, he does not have a quick trigger historically on this unless you've won Super Bowls for him. Like, you know what I mean? It was not good with Jimmy and it was not good with Barry Switzer, but everybody else since... It's been pretty good. It was pretty good for Parcells. It was it was not terrible for Dave Campo. What, what do you mean, looking at? Like? What, what do you mean it was pretty good for Parcells? He wasn't there that long. There was no dude. My he, point. My point he is, blew is him that, out of there for Wade Phillips. But but Jerry, I mean that that was the one who was the highest profile since Jimmy Johnson. That's not what Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott are. Jerry seems to want the 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 credit and these guys do what he wants and they're his guys so they are a reflection of him and so I think he wants to stubbornly believe that the guys who he has empowered and he has vouched and he's like going down with the ship he will never admit that Dak Prescott isn't special or that Mike McCarthy isn't a difference maker because they were his guys, his Okay, finds. so I get that with Dak because he found him in the fourth round and he's yep. not just an owner who sits in the draft room and watches his guys work. He's running the whole entire show, so he gets to put his name on that pick. Okay, and it's very yes. hard for defined franchise quarterbacks in the mid to late rounds. He did that, and he did it with Romo as an undrafted guy. So I understand why Jerry Jones and his – you know, ego the size of the state of Texas would feel that way about the quarterback. I don't get that about the coach, though. He didn't discover Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy wasn't some guy who was getting them copies off the fax machine in, in coffee there in Dallas. He won a Super Bowl someplace else. Well, but so they, why but, would he be loyal but he, to him? Let, he let Kellen Moore go. Dan Quinn is in the building. And Mike McCarthy is not universally regarded as a great coach. And so... He is stubborn. He's not going to let radio host, columnist, NFL network commentator say, like, strong arm him into, hey, you could do better at coach. Jerry is stubborn, man. So, I think, I think, so I think then, he's a stubborn individual. Okay, so just to make sure I hear this right, if they don't win a playoff game this year, you think Mike McCarthy will probably still be back as their coach next year? I think that's absolutely in play. Well, yeah. in play and, and probable are two different things. Yeah, I think it's better than 50-50. Jeez, I don't. <laughs> I think he'd promote Dan Quinn at the very least. I th th I mean, that would be the least. And by the way, and probably be better. But yeah, I, Jerry is a, he's an egomaniac, man. I think, okay, I think, so he, I think he sticks by his guys. The next game is the London game. All right, I found it, it, by the way. I can ask him. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Baltimore still the pick to – we have a lot of London games. We have a lot of all-day football marathons. Right, three weeks in a row, by the way? And this is it. And then there's a break before they go to Germany yep. next month. And Andy Reid gets to get that – you know, he's talking about bratwursts and stuff. Again, not the most concerned with winning, although they did cover – in this game. So people were very happy. Did you predict them? Is that 16 and 0 for you now? Did you lay No, no, no. Pick, picks, picks come out Friday, 15 and 0. Well, can no. you give a sneak peek here or are you saving that for? I got to save it. Okay. Because I do, I saw what got tweeted out this afternoon on Thursday afternoon. And I feel like now there is some momentum building. There's people now that are going to try to tail your picks. 
Oh, but also I've got a lot of listeners who are looking to do the uh, the 0 for 3 parlay. Who believe that now that it, the video is out there, now that it's at a nice clean 15-0, and 0, that now it's time for the old regression. I could see that. A lot, lot of pressure on me tomorrow, buddy. Um. So, All right, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Do, do you still like Baltimore in the AFC North? Well, yeah, so sense? speaking of betting odds, we looked at this on Sunday. The Bengals have the worst odds in the division, but the more I hear people talk about this division, I feel like they're talking themselves into Cincinnati with the worst record in the division. And the hardest shape, schedule. And the hardest schedule. I went through it today on my show. Um. I don't think Baltimore is going to win the division. I do not. I'm going to answer that question directly. No, I do not think they will. And I think this will go down as one of the, well, I think it will go down as the biggest failure of the John Harbaugh, Lamar Jackson partnership. Cause I don't think this year they'll have an excuse. Last two years were injuries. Um, You know, even the year he won the MVP and lost to Tennessee, it was still a great regular season. When they lost the playoff game to Buffalo, they had beaten the Titans in the playoffs. I don't think they're going to win this division, and I think it's so winnable. This is not a good division. It was thought of as maybe the best before the season started. It's actually now one of the weakest, and I think they're going to probably get to like nine and eight and either sneak in as a wild card or miss the playoffs altogether. Do you have a pick? To win the division? Yeah, yeah, this team I cover. I think the Steelers oh, are going to win. Okay, it. okay. Yeah. Well, now I understand. What well, that look is. at their schedule. You want to play the schedule game? Go look at theirs. I mean, Baltimore to... isn't terrible. They've got San Francisco. They got Miami. Uh, they have Detroit. But Baltimore's schedule is not terrible. Um, listen, Cleveland. We don't know what's going on with its quarterback. The Bengals' schedule is brutal, and they're mm-hmm. injured. And your offense doesn't exactly inspire a whole heck of a lot of confidence right now, though. Are you guys finally going to acknowledge that Jalen Warren's the better, the best running back on your roster? Uh, that- I've been telling the Steelers that for months, and they haven't listened, and the answer to that is no. Najee Harris will probably start against the Rams. Okay, so well, that's, idiot- that's idiotic. Uh, are you going to they- answer the question, or are you going to— No, they're going to win. Yes, they are, they, they're— my, I, was make, I was answering the question by pointing out that your questions about Baltimore— pale in comparison to the questions about the other three teams in the division. One team can't score, another doesn't have a quarterback, and another has already suffered the most losses, has the toughest schedule, and the most injuries. So yeah, Baltimore is flawed, but they are the least flawed, I think by a considerable margin, uh, than the other three teams in the division. So yes, Baltimore will still win the division. Seahawks and Bengals. This is my favorite game of the weekend. Do you agree? Um... I do because we were talking about no, you know, no Deshaun Watson obviously hurts that game, and I find Tampa to be pretty boring. Even though uh, I love watching Detroit week in and week out, I thought you were a little disrespectful with where you put Bears Vikings in the rundown. Uh, but yeah, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a very good slate, to be honest with you. It's not a good slate. So I do think, I do think that this is the best game. I think that this is the most interesting. Like if the Bengals offense doesn't look better uh, against Seattle. I think people will get more and more concerned at home, given some of the points allowed that Seattle has given up this year. And we now have the subplot of DK Metcalf's mouth writing checks that Witherspoon has to cash. What did he say? I didn't see that. Oh, he said, uh, he was like, Chase is an awesome player, but he's like, but I think that uh, Devin Witherspoon uh, is going to handle him. Or 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 get the best of them or whatever he said. But I like that. It's it was awesome. And then like Chase responded to it. You know, and Witherspoon is coming off one of the best games a cornerback will have all year, and he is awesome. But Chase is coming off a fifteen catch, three touchdown game. So so you got DK Metcalf with his little injury, but now is he going to try to outdo Chase? You got Witherspoon against Chase. It's it's a it's it's a very fun game. Well, it has shootout potential. It really does. And I know the total if the Bengals' offense is right. Yeah, I mean, if they play like they did last week in Arizona, this has a chance, and Higgins is supposed to come back and play. There can be major fireworks here. It just, it strikes me as the type of game that Sunday, after it's over, we're going to want to start the next podcast episode with it, and we're going to talk want to talk about the ramifications for the team that won the game. You know, Cincinnati lights up Seattle, it's their back. Seattle goes to Cincinnati and lights them up. It's like, wait a minute. 
you know, everybody loves the 49ers in the division, rightfully so, and the Eagles, but like, and the, we love the Lions, but where's this team in that conversation? You know, they will enter the chat if they win a game like this uh, against Cincinnati. And more so, like, if they win the game because Burrow just doesn't look right, then it won't be as much of a big deal. But if they go in there and score like 30 plus points and light them up, it, it will be. I agree with that. Uh, Giants, my goodness, man. We were praising the hell out of Brian Dable last year. Everybody was. So Giants, Bills, is the disaster in New York Brian Dable's fault? You know, here's why I would say yes. Because the head coach there might not be the general manager, but the coach has a ton of say. And you're hearing these things now out of New York. Boomer Siason is talking about how He's hearing that Daniel Jones is the type of quarterback that like needs motivated or like needs the coach to get him up for games and be like the spiritual leader of the team and the guy that everybody follows. And in addition to what he does or doesn't do on the field, like he just does not have, he doesn't project himself and carry himself like a franchise quarterback. And like, if they knew those things about him, in addition to, the obvious questions that there still were about the way he played last year. I mean, he didn't even throw 20 touchdown passes. Yeah. So much of it was what he was doing with his legs. Dable's got to speak up there and say, it's just not a good move to give him this amount of money, even if it is on the short term. And even if eventually there are ways to get out of it, like instead, maybe give Barkley a short term deal, tag Jones, or don't give Jones a contract at all. I mean, I just, he's got to take some culpability for the Giants' commitment to this quarterback because so much of their faith in Jones is tied into what Dable was able to get out of him as coach last year. I think that you're right. There's, it's a tricky spot though. These guys are have all such huge egos. And like, he got praised, he being Dable, because Daniel Jones was somewhat productive, especially compared to what he was before Brian Dable got there. So if they would have then said, we're moving on from Daniel Jones or not committing to him, there would have then, that would have also taken some of the shine off of Brian Dable. And I just, even if it would have been the correct thing to do, he was getting praised as the guy who maximized Daniel Jones. And so to then turn on him with no alternate path to finding another quarterback, teams just don't do it even though they should. But because Danny, if, if, they gotta, branch, if they franchise tag him, I don't think anybody bats an eye at that. Do it for one year. I do think Daniel one, Jones would have had a problem with it. What is he now? He's better than Kirk Cousins? He's above playing on the franchise tag? I'm not saying he's year? above it, but I mean – Teams do not welcome distraction. Like they can get out of it after next year easily, right? But, but they created that distraction by the way the whole Barkley thing went down. So there was going to be that you know distraction either way. A running back than a than a quarterback. I don't know. I feel like in that market, Barkley's a far more beloved player than Jones is. No, but but you're talking about the WFAN and like the market. I'm talking about okay, the but locker. even in that locker room, I feel like there's probably more guys that would support Barkley than Jones. I mean, he's the quarterback of the team, man. Like, it just, it, just it, it it matters more. But I'm telling you that there's credible reporting out of there that says he doesn't act like he's an alpha male. So in that locker room, I thought they might have thought, we're giving this guy $40 million a year. What are we doing? This is Listen, I, I think that what teams should do more of is what you were hinting at at the beginning. Like, what teams normally do is, they're so scared of not having a guy who is startable that they'll pay someone who is startable but not good. Well, that's that's why the that's why San Francisco's idea with Trey Lance, their their heart or head was in the right place. They just executed it so badly. Yeah. They thought we can't we're, we're not settling for Jimmy Garoppolo. We need better. And you're saying a lot of other teams would have just been happy with Garoppolo and probably just paid him and moved right they along have. with him. Yeah, I, I I absolutely think that that's the case. I mean, Kirk Cousins is 
good. Dak Prescott is good. Derek Carr is good, but they're not, they're not special. And I just think it's crazy to pay 20% of your salary cap to not special because then it's so damn hard to build a good team around them. You know, we, we've had this conversation for years with so many different quarterbacks and that's what happened in New York. I'm with you. Patriots Uh, Raiders. What's more likely Josh McDaniels or Bill Belichick with a new team next year. Okay. If, both are not with their current team next year. Bill Belichick is definitely with a new team. If Josh McDaniels gets fired, are we sure he's employable? He'll be a coordinator somewhere, 100%. Why? Because there's enough friends of Belichick and look at his resume and what he did with Tom Brady where he'll get a job somewhere for sure. But Not as a head what, coach. What evidence is there that Josh McDaniels is a very good offensive coordinator even? His track record with Brady and what he did in New... Yeah, I, that's what I'm just with telling you. Brady is a huge qualifying phrase there, man. Correct. I know it is. He has not proven to be an additive offensive force in a non-Bill Belichick, Tom Brady ecosystem in the NFL anywhere ever, period. I just, I, like, I know he would get a job, Old Boys Network or whatever, but, like, I took your question more as, like, as a head coach. And I know, like, sure, offensive coordinator, he could be a quarterback coach. He has a zero. My my question is, who is more likely to get get fired at the end of the year, Josh McDaniels or Bill Belichick? I think that Bill Belichick will never be fired. I think that there might be a parting of ways. Okay. So okay. give Am I qualifying my way out of, out of your questions here? Yes. I'm semantically arguing around your question. Right. Okay. Mr. Debate Club champion in the state hey, of Illinois. It wasn't a club. It was a state. Thank you. Thank you very much. 2005. Uh, can the Raiders afford to fire Josh McDaniels? That's why I asked the question, because I think most people would just say, Josh McDaniels, let's move on to the next question. But you have to take into account stuff like that. Yeah. I, I think that Belichick, it's approaching 50 50 like down from 90 80 70 like that he is on his way out in in new england but josh mcdaniel should have been fired before the damn season so i will say that belichick is on a new team next year just based on where this is trending but the answer is probably both the answer is probably both but belichick as a head coach and josh mcdaniel's maybe as a water boy or something and i hope it's in chicago year off I hope what you get after what you just said about Josh McDaniels. I hope you get Belichick head coach, Josh McDaniels offensive coordinator working with Justin Fields next year. I do not. That is not something I'm interested in. Commanders Falcons. You skipped a game. Did I? See, I, I did. can't trust you to I, go through. I this did. I did. I did. I'm listen. I'm 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 mostly paying attention. Saints Texans. Is this the game that C.J. Stroud finally looks like a rookie? I think so. Right law of averages here. Isn't this like the bad matchup for him, even though they're at home? Isn't this Saints the defense one, has been great. Yeah, isn't this the one where, you know, Danny, I know you're a red zone nut. You look over and Scott Hansen's like, oh, there's C.J. Stroud's third interception of the game. Oh, I there's that, a, yeah, there's a, you know, he gets smashed and the ball flies up in the air and it's picked off by, honey badger and he takes it to the house like I just see this as a game where he gets reminded that it is the NFL and it's not going to be this easy and and just to be just to be clear here if that happens I'm not going to think really any less of CJ Stroud because to do it for five straight games without a gaffe is phenomenal Um, but I do like you're saying your listeners are going to bet against you because you've got hit 15 in a row I think this is the time to bet against CJ Stroud. Yeah, the odds are that this is going to be a tough spot for him. But look at the total in the game 42 yeah, and a half, how low it is. Yeah. Um, Tampa put up 26 on the Saints. Everybody yeah, weird, else. Weird day because Carr, by all rights, probably shouldn't have played. I think that that took the wind out of their sails. Yeah. I mean, 
every other game, 16, 15, 20 to 17, 18 to 17. And then obviously last week they held the Patriots uh, to zero. Have you seen some of the new England offensive stats going around, by the way, that it is 24 consecutive offensive drives without a point. Yep. And I think it's 34 offensive drives without a touchdown. That is impossible. That is bears esque. That is so bad. Uh, but yeah, I think we're both on the same page that this is going to be an ugly, ugly, ugly football game. A tough spot for CJ Stroud. What's the next game? Commanders and Falcons. QB more likely to remain remain a starter for next year. Sam Howell or Desmond Ritter? Oh, this is a great question. This is your best question of the day. I think the answer is Sam Howell. But I think the answer is that ne- like the correct answer is that neither of them will be starting quarterbacks next year. I cannot imagine a world where Atlanta doesn't make a significant investment in a quarterback with those three skill position players still being cheap. Right with with Pitts and London and Bijan. It strikes me even though Ritter had a good game last week. Is it possible that Howell plays well enough, they win enough games that he is the starter for them next year because they don't really feel like they're all that close and they don't think that they can – it's not the time to trade the first-round picks to move up to take the third quarterback in the draft because no one's trading out of Drake May or Caleb Williams? Like, maybe. You know, but I I, I think both teams have new starters next year. Uh, So I think it's Sam Howell who – oh, no, excuse me. I think it's Desmond Ritter who is more likely to be the quarterback, and here's why. I think there's going to be a coaching change in Washington. There's already been an owner change there. I just think that they're ready after a year of just sitting on Ron Rivera and, and giving Howell a full season after he was drafted the year before. I think that they, okay, we saw it. We didn't like it. Everybody, see ya. You know, Howell maybe sticks around as the backup quarterback. We're going to get either a veteran in here or somebody else to be our starting quarterback uh, by hook or by crook, whether it's a rookie or not. I think he's gone uh, as the starter. Ritter, I think it comes down to this. If Atlanta wins that division, which is still, I think, in play, and yeah. he continues to have games like the one we have he had on Sunday against Houston mixed in with games where he's not very good. And there's maybe every three or four games he shows you potential. If they win nine games that way and the coach is the same, does he just run it back with Ritter for an extra year? I think they could. Um, so so we, we kind of have the same argument though, because like I mean, if they I agree with you that Chico's probably gone, but I think that Bienemy is a hu- is a prime candidate to get promoted there. And I had Washington as being decent before the year. They've lost games, you know, a couple of their losses are really, really good teams, right? Buffalo, Philly. Like I I do I do still think it's in play that Washington, I think Washington's more likely to be an eight win. Team. I mean, I know Ritter had a very good game. And Atlanta. Week. I think they're they're right there. I mean, yeah, I do. I think they're very similar teams. Who do you think wins this game? By the way, I think Atlanta will. But I just hold that thought for a second here because sometimes you say things, and I just want to double check to see if the people that make these odds for a living think that you're right. I would be stunned if those teams' win totals currently are the same. Atlanta and Washington. So Atlanta's is nine and a half right now, bro, is their win total. Nine and a half and Washington's six and a half. That is how far off you are on both teams. Well, hold on a second. That might be how far off they are. Did you ever consider that? Well, that's right. You are 15 and 0, so you are kicking the odds makers ass. So <laughs> I have to take that into account. You do know more than them right now. Six and a half, huh? Yep, for your commanders. And nine and a half for Atlanta. You go nine and eight, that. you don't win that. I got to be honest, I don't love that, Pony. Uh, Panthers and, and Dolphins. Oh, I'm looking at the schedule here. Hold on a second. Yeah, I can see that. Man, no, nine and a half is too high. 
Not, not, nine and a half is an under, buddy. I'll tell you that right uh, now. The guy who, who sees the NFL, <laughs> nine and a half is an under. The Go dude ahead. who averages 13 yards per carry and his eight touchdowns for Miami is out now. What's his name? Achan. 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 Uh, what should Miami do? Nothing. Or do they just go like San Francisco did last year? Do they just make it other than a Claypool lottery ticket? Do they do something bold here and team somebody else with Mo- with Moster and say, if we get this guy back at any point this year, great, but we're loaded. Well, they say that Achan, I mean, this is another one of those situations where I know you think it's a cop out, but like I have a policy, like the running back or the, the injury thing, I don't know. They say he will be back. They put him on IR, but they said it's not going to end the season. So if that's true and it's four games, what they really believe, maybe five, maybe six, but like that they are absolutely confident that Achan is going to be a, a meaningful contributor for them down the stretch of the regular season and into the playoffs. Trading for running backs is nine times out of 10 dumb. And their offense has been so incredible. And we've talked about some of the things that have happened to teams around them, both in the division and the conference in general, that I don't think that trading draft picks that are meaningful for running backs are, are is a good thing. And like, listen, if you told me Christian McCaffrey would be on the Dolphins, obviously that would be awesome for them. But Jonathan Taylor just signed a contract and he's not a good pass catcher and that's not going to be the guy. So like, okay. So if you, you have I to told, tell me the fast, all right. So running back for okay. a mid to late round pick. Okay. So I'm going to, I was just going to about to do that. What pick would you be willing to give up if you're Miami for Saquon Barkley? That's interesting. Um, When he is, it's a one year, ten million dollar deal or whatever it is. One year, eleven million, and then he's and but you can franchise him again because he signed I, that weird contract. Or I'm can not, the team that trades for him not is not able to do that? I'm not really a hundred percent sure on that, but but, I'm I, not, but, I think, I, but I'm pretty sure the Giants can franchise tag him. I'm almost positive of that. All right, well then maybe they can. I mean, I don't know how. No, but my 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 point is is that like I don't think that you trade a second round pick for Saquon Barkley if you can't have him next year. Okay, so my thing on that is I think the right price in my head would be a third round pick, where it to me would be a no brainer to do it. But if I had to give up a second round pick, I think I would pull the trigger on it if I'm the Dolphins, because why not? Even with no guarantee that he could be on the team next year? You figure it's going to be late second round pick. If you it, There's a chance, like McCaffrey, you put this guy in your offense and it's just, holy shit, like another, if he's healthy. <laughs> it's a big, it's I know it is, It was, but that was the case when McCaffrey got traded for. People were saying that about him. If he's, he- if he's healthy, if he's healthy, if he's healthy. And that offense, not behind that Giants offensive line, in a quarterback that can't make plays downfield, I mean, oh, I mean, they would be it would be a cheat code. And plus, the other thing is not that this would be the number one reason why you do it. Like, you keep them away from teams like Buffalo or like somebody else who you would consider Baltimore, maybe who could get them and beat you in the playoffs. I would that'd be that'd be a blockbuster trade. That'd be really fun. Eagles Jets. You think the Jets defense slows down Philly? I do. I do. They slow down I'm, everybody. I know. I'm <sighs> like, I mean, to just define slow down, like scores under their season average. Yeah, of course. I, I mean, I want to say right now that the Jets are going to win this game. I want to say that out loud. I want to just speak that out there and have you ridicule me and say, I have the crystal ball. I'm football Nostradamus, and that's dumb. But that's like where, that's where I wanted to go. I soft pedaled it with the question, but that's really what I was thinking in my head. When I what is the formula for given what we just saw the Eagles do against Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, and Matt Stafford, you know, and play 
by far their best game of the year, the game that made them look the most like they did last year. They've not had a very impressive schedule early on, but like, how are the Jets scoring enough points to win the game? Well, their defense is shutting down, not shutting. I I don't even want to say shut down because I don't think it's going to be that pronounced, but. I mean, the total's low, man. Total's very low. Their defense makes the Eagles run game not so dominant that everything comes off of that plays downfield the AJ Brown everything else they lose or their best weapon or their their biggest strength is somewhat neutralized and when that happens the Eagles go from a team that can score 30 points and instead they're a team that's going to score more like 20. And if you mix a couple turnovers in there, well, then maybe they score 16 or 14 instead of 20. So that's, I think, the way they do it. They hit a couple big plays. So, yes, I mean, so you're saying 17 would would have to be enough to win, right? Like a real low scoring game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I think the Jets defense can do that to Philadelphia. I mean, they did it to the Chiefs. Not that the Chiefs' offenses looked great this year, but yeah, I mean the Jets' defense is good showings against the best teams in the league, like Chiefs, Bills. So yes, they, like, they definitely can do it. When Aaron Rodgers went out, and we saw Zach Wilson play immediately after that, and he was so bad, would you have guessed that this Week Six line would only be a touchdown? I know where the no, game is. You, no, right? I mean the Jets, like the way they've played has made this line at least a one score line. And I know it's still big, but it almost feels like the odds makers are respecting the Jets a good deal here to make it only a seven point spread. Run the ball. Like if they can run the ball with my guy Brees Hall, who I drafted in our running back total yardage draft in the offseason, looking like a pretty good pick. Looking like a pretty good pick. Really? He's going to lead the league in rushing. They're giving Delvin Cook carries there. I didn't say lead the league in rushing. It was total cumulative yardage. I, I'm just saying, there's a lot of you patting yourself on the back here on today's show. <laughs> that back's been through a lot. Don't <laughs> I got long arms, though, so it helps me for the back patting. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Cardinals and Rams. Which team should feel better about its season to this point? The Rams. Because the Cardinals... Maybe the players and the coaches are proud of themselves for beating the Cowboys and being plucky and covering spreads and overachieving or only losing by two touchdowns or whatever to Cincinnati, like whatever the moral victory of the moment is. But they were pretty clearly organizationally trying to be bad by design with Houston's pick and getting the number one pick and getting Caleb and pairing him with someone. And they might just mess that whole thing up. Whereas the Rams, F them picks, old roster, like they've won a couple of games and Stafford looks good. Cup looks good. Win this game against the Cardinals, you're three and three and you're alive in the NFC wildcard race where if you play another play and get into the playoffs again after that Super Bowl, you're not a fluke or a one year wonder. So I think it's the Rams. That's that's the exact right answer. That's pretty much verbatim what I had in my head before you started talking. If it were flipped and you asked me the question, you would have had that same spiel come out of my mouth. I just, I'm still, I'm still curious what's going to happen to Dobbs when Kyler Murray comes back because he did come back down to earth in their last game. Yeah. But, and Wilson has played well enough in New York where I don't think they would bench him for Dobbs. But is there a team that would trade for Dobbs between now and the trade deadline around whatever it is, first weekend? You don't think so? No. Okay. I mean, I, th- I just think it's – teams that are trading for a quarterback midseason, A, it's rare. B, I assume – Garoppolo be... went to San Francisco and did pretty well. Well, but so that, but that's what I'm saying, though. Like, it, it it's a contender. Like, a, a, a con- what, what contender – is he upgrading? You know, I mean, 
if you wanted to say you were going to trade for him just to bring him into your building to compete or be there for next year or long term or something yeah. with an old, you know, I just, I just, You're right. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think he's shown enough to upgrade a team that is also winning games. Like, I, I don't think so. Um, Colts, Jaguars. How are we feeling about our Colts bet? Uh, I didn't like the Anthony Richardson diagnosis that I got this week, which is he's going to be out for a while. He's going to be out for a very long time. Dude, Gardner Minshew's a player. I know, man, but are, they're they're going to ride him out to a division championship. That was the bet that we made. <laughs> uh, and he's if Richardson's out for two months, I didn't factor that into the math that was floating around in my head when I was devising a scenario for them to unseat Jacksonville. Do you know what Gardner Minshew's career touchdown to interception ratio is? Yes. I read it to you weeks ago on this podcast. You pretended like you were shocked by it, but you probably weren't paying attention to me, which is why you're trying to repeat it to me right now, bro. Because we get to this point where we're on like the 14th game of the podcast and you're just thinking up ways. What can I say right now to get this thing over with? And that's what you're doing to me, dude. <laughs> I hate you. Do you know what Gardner Minshew's career passer rating is? It's like, yes, it's 90-something. Yeah, right? 90, 93. Yeah. 46 touchdowns against 15 picks. Yep. This guy's a player. We're fine. Go win this game. So you're picking him to win this game then, huh? No. Kind of, we'll have to yeah. wait until 345 on Friday for that. That's right, 345 Central, baby. That's Parkers where all the, Parkers versus that's where all the picks versus... live now. <laughs> that is where the picks live now. That's, that's where we get paid. Got to drive them, got to drive them there. Um, all right, Vikings and Bears. You said it was, it was very disrespectful. disrespectful. They're one win teams, bro. <laughs> it's, the, it's the worst matchup by records in the league this week. Does this game determine Kirk Cousins' fate? See, that's a quarterback that if he did get traded, could upgrade a team. Um, I Isn't the answer like yes, as in if the Vikings lose, they're going to have a desire to trade him. It's just going to be a matter of whether or not he signs off on a team. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I yeah. think if he, I think if he loses, they'd be insane not to try to trade him. I think if they lose, they'll also like. Something's up with Justin Jefferson. Like, yeah. He he does not seem happy. And I'm wondering, like, what odds would I have to give you Justin Jefferson has played his last game as a Viking? Probably like 25 to 1. 25 to 1? Yeah. Okay. You don't think there's any world in which that guy gets traded for a couple of first-round picks? Uh, if, if it's only two first round picks, I would fire the entire front office right after the trade went through. <laughs> he's, I mean, he's amazing. Yes. Yeah. You don't trade that guy. He's a future hall of famer. I agree. In his you prime. Build, you build around that guy. Yeah. I, I, I agree. He seems very upset. Is there a team other than Kirk Cousins, other than the jets that makes sense for Kirk Cousins? Um... Well, he'd upgrade a lot of teams, but that's not exactly how you're asking the question. Because I have a hilarious one in my head right now. Okay, I mean, but doesn't he upgrade Atlanta? Yes. But I don't think they'll do it. But I have a, but I, you know what? I'm not going to put that on it. Like, oh, I'm not going to shoot it down because whether it's realistic or not. Should they do it? Yes, they should. I, but I, but I have a hilarious one in my head. That I want to run by you. Okay. Pittsburgh? <laughs> no. <laughs> if you're Tennessee, why not just say, give us Kirk Cousins for the rest of the year and like take Ryan Tannehill off our hands and we'll even like, we'll even spruce up, we'll even give you a better draft pick to just take him out of here and he can be a placeholder for you if you even want to play him. If not, we don't care. But give us a quarterback right now. I think he's got two touchdowns, five interceptions, and is, in my opinion, one of the five worst starting quarterbacks in the league. 
And let's see if we can win this division with a guy that's more of a top 10, top 12 quarterback. Uh, I mean, he'd, he'd be an upgrade. Because the Titans have a better chance to make the playoffs than the Jets. Would you agree with that? Just the Jets are in a division with the Dolphins and Bills. The best they can do is third, even with that trade. Tennessee can win its division. You think that the best, I mean, they're one game back of Buffalo right now and they beat them. You don't think that the Jets, if the Jets had Kirk Cousins tomorrow, you don't think that the Jets? You love the Bills. What are you doing here? You're making an argument against your own Bills positivity. Yeah, I know, but you just gave the the Jets Kirk Cousins. I I liked the Jets before the year when they had Aaron Rodgers. Right, but did you also factor in that Miami was going to look this good before the year started? No, no. I did not. No, that's, right. that surprises me. So Jacksonville's looked worse than you probably thought. Yes. Indy's starting quarterback is out for two months, regardless of what you just said about Minshew's stats. They are good, and we do like them. But if if Kirk Cousins got traded to Tennessee tonight, they might – They might. They, I was going to say they'd have the best odds in the division – they pro- they might have the best odds in the division with that trade. But NFL teams don't think outside the box like you and me do. That's the problem with this league. Well, no, you are you are I'm outside the box. You're way outside the box. <laughs> you don't even have a box. Um So what's our power ranking of Cousins teams? Jets like in terms of most interesting jets falcons titans that's our list well i think atlanta would be the i think atlanta would be the best destination for him but i think i like tennessee more than i like atlanta i mean more than i like the jets okay at this point okay um we like the coach there we like Vrabel. we yeah. hate everything else about the team all right, let's end this. Okay. <laughs> I knew we I, I will be listening at I'll be on the air, but I might just have my producer pod you up at 345 so an even bigger audience can get your 15 and 0 pick. That'd be beautiful. That that'd be that'd it's be a public amazing. service to the world that I think I should participate in. You know how I we think, do the picks though, right? Doesn't your wife call in or something? It's Parkins versus Parkins versus Spiegel versus Spiegel. It's screw it's, all that. Don't have anybody else. You need the entire segment to get these picks. And now that you're undefeated, but the, part, the other Parkins isn't my wife. It's Owen. He's adorable. Well, good for him. I mean, he's got he's three and a half. Yeah, he's got another, you know, eighty five years of making picks here. Tomorrow, I want to hear you. And we should get a memo from your boss that says all sports talk stations across the I, I don't feel should a have lot of institutional that. support, I gotta say. I, I I was the first one to bring that up in a text to you. I thought, yes, I, I know. Now you're making me feel very insecure about the publicity, the publicity for this incredible streak. Sports betting is everywhere, it's blown up. No one in America has done a better job at picking games than you this year. And only like 10 people know about it. It's not for, it's not right. It's not right. <laughs> it's not right. I should, yeah. BetQL, every, you, you should be a guest on every single one of those shows. Yeah. All right, I got to go. I'll see you. All right, man. Good stuff. All right, All right first and pod. Peace. 